Good morning. When we're looking at cannabinoid research and we look at the basis of working with the plant, as we know more about the plant and move from anecdotal data and anecdotal work within the extraction process, it becomes more and more apparent as we use scientific tools that the plant is more complex and more similar to the other challenges that we see with natural products. During this presentation, we want to talk about some of the new technology, as well as some of the disruptive technology that would be have to be used as we're looking at the plant and using it for more uh, testing with patients. During this time, We'll talk about the effects of human wellness on natural products, not being a new study, but certainly the challenges of those studies. Review some of the practical theory of concentration, that with solventless versus solvent-based processes. And then what's next? As cannabis concentration technology is transitioning from a non-regulated to regulated market, and also the amount of time that has to be spent on really looking at the processes and costs of manufacturing. Looking at some of the hybrids of solventless and solvent-based technologies and seeing how the product quality is increasing and the amount of isolation that's needed. And this is based on formulation-centric processes. Knowing that we're trying to make something and then knowing the ingredients that have to be in that product. There's natural products that you already know. Pacific yew tree with taxol for cancer. Fungus for cyclosporin. Willow bark for aspirin, quinine. Each one of these has gone through the transition of moving from a natural product and then moving through a synthetic product. But also there's other products that we use every single day that we're not taking those same um, transitions. When you look at cannabis itself and start to look at what we have done as humans to be able to categorize the type of cannabis, we've separated it into marijuana cannabis and separated it into hemp, which is also cannabis, and somewhere along the way diluted that definition, the scientific definition, and then moving it through a process of looking at two major compounds and identifying the plant based on that for regulatory purposes. This has added more confusion as we've moved through the Farm Bill for the United States and some of the other countries that are providing the raw material and crude extracts that are then shipped into the United States or across the world. We look at high THC, we look at mixed THC, one to one or three to one, then high CBD, where it has a greater amount of the CBD versus THC. But each one of these has brought about more and more confusion. If we look at the plant factory and knowing that it can be made faster than the chemical engineers can make isolated products, then we understand the entire process that can be done. CBGA comes from a number of different products, but you, as you look at the plant, you see that from that, with the appropriate synthases from CBGA to CBDA synthase, and CBGA plus THCA synthase provides the product of THCA. From there, with decarboxylation, where you're actually taking off a CO2 group, we're able to move it into what is now called a neutral THC. But even within those processes, we look at the overall process of oxidation and being able to have degradation products. This seemed like the most appropriate one in the early days. But since that time, we've realized that there are more compounds we probably always knew that there were more compounds. It's now with the literature being able to support it.
when you look at this detail and knowing that you're going from a plant to a pill and knowing that you're using it for a certain purpose you can see that it's not just four or five compounds and it's not just being able to move through and look at one variety it's also the genetics that allow you to influence the monoterpenes, sesquiterpenes, and the diterpenes. It's also a matter of being able to look at the different compounds that are in that plant are synthesized, but there's also the, the, the degradation products that we saw before. So it's a much more detailed process, and that's what we're trying to look at when we're doing a concentration. It's a good article by Ernest Small that walks through the entire process of evolution and classification. And so on our side, we've started to, as humans, try to classify these into broad base plant categories, whether it's the size of the stock or it's the size of the roots or it's the uh, compounds that are in the trichomes. Each one of these has a classification. As you look at this study out of um, University of Mississippi, and you see the number of cannabinoids that are possible and the number of isomers. So it's not just CBD, but there's seven known isomers of CBD. There's trans THC, and there's cis CHC, and there's trans delta 8. Each one of these is based on the chemistry and many of the times that we've seen it, we've been having the technology that only allows us to measure the broad base strokes of THC. And we'll look at some of those in the impact on transit on extraction. But you also have different types of the cannabinoids, the proteins. You also have alcohols, aldehydes, you have flavonoids, and all of these provide an opportunity to make sure that you have the same ingredients in a product that you're making. This is an interesting study done by Dr. Lewis at NAPRO Research. And on this, across the bottom, you see that the graphs, even if you can't read them, show that the terpene ratios of these three varieties are similar. And you can also see up on the top that the ratios of the cannabinoids is significantly different. The first one being CBDA at 14%, the middle one, a one to one of CBDA and THCA, and the one on the right, a larger amount of THCA than CBD. And yet at the same time, you can see that from the other spider graphs that the ones on the right with the green bars, the experience of the participants was similar. But you can also see that the, but you don't know what the cannabinoid experience was that the body had based on these broad based cannabinoids. So you can see that there's a lot of changes and a lot of things to concern about with extraction. Extraction is very much like where's Waldo. When you're looking for that, you have the number of components that are in a cannabinoid plant, but which ones, how big, how many, how much, and how do you get to them? And what's their stability? Can you take them from the plant and being able to know what they are? And each one is a reality. There's so much going on in the plant. There's so much happening. And each one of these, you're still maybe looking for where's Waldo, but you're also looking for all the other things that are happening at that in that stage, and each one being very complex. So as we move from that, let's look more at the practical theory of concentration, solventless and solvent-based. Somewhere along the way, we figured out that extraction is a magical thing that happens. You go from a field, miracle, and then there's oil. And there's a lot of different people that have, would, would have different choices of how they would do the extraction. But the decisions really have to be data-driven. And the decisions really have to be scientific process and regulatory increases. 
and the use of technology that's in major universities. So whether it's a type three as crops are grown, how do you know which one these are? How do you know from the varieties that you see here what is actually happening? And it's very much what we do every day. Coffee, hot brew versus cold brew. Which variety? Where did the plants come from? Where did the beans come from? How are they dried? Tea is even a better example. When we talk about the where's Waldo, the tea example, there's so many compounds in tea. What do you have for flavors of fragrances? Caffeinated, non-caffeinated, uh, different things that are already in the tea. And then you have cleaning. How do, you, how do you clean dishes? How do you clean clothing? That's all part of what you're looking at when you're thinking about extraction and concentration. And we do it every day. So what is the best concentration? Once that I believe the botanical materials, integrity is maintained to ensure the concentration of the desired components in a natural form. From the natural form, you can do other things for degradation and make other compounds, but you're really trying to make what the plant already has. Effective concentration for E with efficacy first, efficiency economics, each one of these is very important. In predefined boundaries, the safety and health of everyone is incredibly important for being able to make sure that we can move the, the technology forward in natural products. And testing with modern technology, it invests in every facet of the business, not only for the cost of manufacturing, but also for the knowledge of what's in that plant. When you look at a workflow, it's typically looking at so many compounds, much like we talked about with tea, with many, many compounds, and each one of the ones below is a different compound, and those are the only ones that are being detected. And then as you work through the purification process, you find more of the com components that you're looking for, and then finally, Sometimes you're getting all the way down to the standard to be able to make sure that as you're moving through with the process, you're able to make to have a, a uh, amount of material in a, an ingredient in a product that is similar every single time. A great paper that was done uh, with uh, a lot of people, but Dr. King being one of them, shows the pre-processing, the post-processing, and the extraction. Each one of these facets we'll look at for just a moment. The pre-processing from the grinding to the power, depoxylation, if people are doing that, there's a number of different ways of doing this, but it also enhances the type of concentration where you could do a concentration with the grinding or, or being able to have a non-solvent um, capability of, of uh, having the, the resins and also having the uh, trichomes knocked off so that you, the pre-processing can be even part of another step in a, in a concentration that doesn't involve solvent. If you were to do CO2, this is just CO2 is going to be the same with ethanol or hexane or butane or, or any of the other ones. We're mostly just looking at this step as being the extraction step if you're using a solvent to move from taking the oil off the plant. And then you have the processing from oil to winterization, where people take off the waxes. Maybe you want the waxes, maybe you don't. What are the end products based on that? Each one of these moves through a process of oil and a solvent and taking off the oil, adding the oil or distillation. And with the use of heat and with the use of transferring from one to the other and different concentrations of acid, there is a lot of chance in the early days of being able to not to degrade a product and have things that are unexpectedly showing up in a product that if it's not handled with care that you will have other products and not having safe and but you need also um, equipment to be able to know when that happens so with solvent looking at the early days it would be a pure solvent but now as you're moving forward the disruptive technology is looking at multiple solvents giving that a greater flexibility. So whether it's water, isopropyl, you know, carbon dioxide, acetone, you know, uh, liquid hydrocarbons, gaseous hydrocarbons, each one of these is going to be able to have a mixture, have a, a product that's in, that is extracted. And it can be a little bit different as you change 
a mixture of the solvents. Or solventless with grinding and, and separation and we'll look at some of the different types of um, solventless. So with pulse of electricity or microwave or acoustic knocking off trichomes and being able to use things that don't involve a solvent and then further taking that product for the leftover that after you've taken the solventless and then moving it through a solvent. So whether you're making hash or you're making rosin you're taking in the isolation of the trichomes, you're, you're sizing them, you're knowing what's in them. And then the same thing with the rosin, except that you're using pressure and squeezing them, much like you would squeeze an orange, but you're getting a different set of compounds based on them. But both of these are non-solvent. Well, what's next? And let's look at some of the transitions. Number one, the transition as you start to look at this paper with the emerging challenges of extraction analysis, bioanalysis of cannabinols. I like this paper because it, it shows not only from the um, a small uh, size scale, but it shows you the different types of separation and different types of molecules and compounds that are taken off based on the different solvents and being able to be able to analyze whether it's in a human for uh, testing or whether it's from liver each one of these as you're looking through a clinical trial would have to be monitored throughout the system so it's not just the extraction to be able to make a commercial product it's also the extraction to be able to, to analyze in different phases regulatory sampling of hemp and using all the different methods as you're using UPLC or using high you know, high resolution liquid chromatography and you're using mass spectrometry, you now have another layer of being able to look at the compounds and also be able to have confirmation. As you look towards greater mass spectrometry with ion mobility, you're able to take and see the different isomers. So it's not just CPD and it's not just THC. There's cis and trans. There's different optical isomers with rotation of light and you can see from from over on the right hand side that even with each one of these it it found three different isomers within within one with one chromatographic peak using the mass spectrometer as your second phase of a separation technology the key is not so much the type of how they did it but the fact that you can see next to the THC up in the top one at 357 um, M over Z, you're, you're also seeing that you have three isomers. It's not just one compound that the chromatography picked up. There's three more isomers underneath that peak. So whether you're using solvent or not using solvent, some of the hybrid technology is being able to use both of them. So you have extraction and you have separation. If you're using some with the natural products and grinding and then doing supercritical fluid extraction, then you're doing a separate action. You're doing solvent without solvent and then solvent. When you're doing other types of hybrids, having other types of components within the extraction process without the solvent and then moving towards a solvent and transitioning, for example, if you were to have a, when you're doing ethanol, and then being able to uh, extraction and then you're able to take the compounds and then you're able to get rid of the ethanol and then you do a separation on a column to be able to to look at purification then you're you're being able to have more and more flexibility in the compounds that you want in your uh, mixture so when you're looking at technology the microwave ultrasonic pulse electric field each one of these allows you to have a difference extraction based on what you're doing for the preparation and you're also able to do inline uh, centrifuges whether you're decanting tricanting you're doing parallel you're doing horizontal each one of these allows you to have a, a different type of separation process as well as inline filtration whether you're trying to get rid of pesticides or you're trying to get rid of color or you're trying to have other things in line whether it's organic aqueous or a hybrid between those two 
Each one of these has modules that allows you to keep the cost of manufacturing down. So when you're thinking of, the, of, of concentration, you think of three things, speed, scale, and selectivity, the three S's. Speed is the entire cycle time of a concentration process. So when we're talking about the next disruptive technology, you're, time, you're talking about the entire time, not just one phase of the ethanol or just one phase of the grinding or just one phase of winterization. You're talking about the entire process from the time the plant comes in until you have the ingredients that come out. Scale is the being able to understand between the small and the large size samples and being able to grow it from something have a, a larger amount per day and that's the scale and selectivity is how much selectivity you would have of the components you have so if you're doing scale or you're doing speed you actually only get to pick two you're either going to go fast with a large scale or you're going to ha have a smaller scale with selectivity but it's going to be slower each one of these is a choice and that's the choice that you're trying to make from a formulation centric point of view but then you start to expand how much how much money do you have so now you have spend and you have safety and simplicity you have the added s's of being able to know what else you have to have for the cost of manufacturing and the people that are going to be running the system and there's three ways to make money increase revenue decrease cost or optimize asset utilization and as you're growing a business you start off smaller and then assuming that you're trying to make more money to be able to continue to put money back into the business you're trying to figure out how do I decrease costs how do I have more automation how do I have to not have overtime and optimization as far as your current assets and your fixed assets how can I use the same assets that if they're not viable for what I'm doing today is there another way to use them or do I have to sell them so it comes to formulation centric extraction it's really about asking the qualifying questions about goals and expectations it's about doubling your time to market and tripling your initial investment calculations it's going to be more it's going to take more time than you think and it's going to take a lot more investment it's about retaining the key people on your team and knowing when to change their roles what are they doing today and what will they have to be doing in two years as well as about written goals and matching them with reality it's okay to have an idea and a plan but you really have to have a plan that's written down for example we've seen many people looking at the change between delta 9 and delta 8 the compound on the left side is delta 8 and you notice that the, the carbons are numbered the double bond between number 8 and number 9 carbon and number 9 and number 10 carbon are the only two things that separate these two compounds uh, chemically. But the change in the body is significant and that's why you're able to look at delta 8 as a separate compound and seeing what its changes are. It's the same way you would be thinking about THC and CBD. This one change in the double bond is significant as far as the body's retention and as you're doing the synthesis you can make delta 8 from delta 9 it's a moving of the of the carbon bond it's a a, a slow I mean it's a a low kinetic um, activity to be able to move from one to the other and then also holding the chemistry the same as you can see from the dark line and the dotted line keeping that um, rotational chemistry as well as cis and trans is important if it's done before this time there will be some isomerization and other compounds that are made that you don't want so when you're doing THCA and you take off a, a carbon a CO2 group and now you have delta 9 and through the oxidative degradation you slowly get to CPN which people use as a measure for degradation but also you can move that by enhancing that separation because CBN is a very different molecule from Delta 9 as far as the body is concerned and so now you're trying to take the original compounds that were made in the in the plant 
in trying to degrade them or do other synthetic cannabinoids. So at what point in time is it a synthetic cannabinoid versus a natural one? And when you're looking at each one of these, it's a process that's taken place. Whether it's used in synthesis or whether it's modified a little bit to have greater bioactivity or different activity. These are all the things that are happening in the process. But to be able to do that, you need to have an extraction process that you understand. This is a picture of a system that separates the different natural products, any product that's out there, but happens to be with the natural product that we're looking at. Over on the right hand side, that big huge tube is the chromatographic column. And it's not the largest chromatograph column, it's a 20 centimeter column. But what you're trying to do is you're trying to use all the instrumentation on the left hand side to be able to provide the CO2 and the ethanol to provide a separation that's reproducible. Well, what would this look like? One is the chromatography can look broad. But what you're really trying to do is you're trying to separate a mixture of different components. And from there, you have now have several steps in the purification, or you're trying to eliminate a peak. So you could be eliminating one of these and hold everything else the same to be able to have a, a, uh, a different set of ingredients for taking advantage of the entourage effect. So how does that look? This would be the unknown. So you can see there's a lot of different components in here, including THCA and THC. You see at three minutes and the CBD at 2.6 minutes. And you also notice a lot of CBC through these extraction. And then what you do is you try and separate out the ones that you don't want the THC. So the THC afterwards has been eliminated, but you've kept all the other compounds within there so that you are able to have an entourage effect. Another way of doing that is adding different components to an extraction, whether it's adding in um, co-solvent rather than just CO2. And we spoke about that. We spoke about adding different types of compounds to be able to change the polarity, to be able to change the different solvent that will take out different components and then having different separators on, on the backside. It's also being able to, to take off different components when you want with, with switching valves. So again, here we see a CO2, and we're just using CO2 in this example. It's going through a pump, goes through an extraction vessel, and then up, up on the top right-hand side, you have a switching valve. You go through um, an, another collection vessel with dry ice and acetone. You collect the terpenes under very uh, light conditions and then you switch and then you take out the cannabinoids so very quickly you can see how you can separate different components based on just one instrument another one is ultrasound assisted here you're being able to have more of the ultrasound before it goes through an extraction process to break open the trichomes for example each one of these allows you to have the greater use of kinetics and getting different compounds, but also getting them in a faster rate because you've made them more amenable. This is a picture of a scanning electron microscope that shows the fact of opening up all those trichomes or in any types of cell. Here you just see the original cell and you see the broken open cells that allow you to see that you're getting a greater capability of, of extractor. Ultrasonics, again, were different types of using just ultrasonics for itself, whether it's rosemary or, or, or if it's cocoa butter or anything else, you're still using those same principles and using them for the cannabinoids. If you're looking at the different types of, of work that can be done to, to measure the um, extraction efficiency, and so you're able to build a short amount of types of extractor. Over on the right hand side you see you have ethanol or you have um, ethanol um, at different temperatures and presence and what you get from the extraction and you can see the graph up on the top showing you where the maximum of each one of those is.
and the interplay between chemistry and morphology. I mean, the whole process is looking at the number of different things that can be happened on a cannabis plant. And I think the part that I saw here was with the increased increase interest in cannabis and international desire to harness its therapeutic potential in the context of modern medicine is surprising how much is still unknown and how much we have more to learn. So when you see that, I see other opportunities in developing different oral um, administrated uh, edibles, looking at different um, industrial hemp. What can you do as far as, as looking at um, optimizing prior to distillation? Each one of these allows you to see a greater capability, but look at the uh, journal article. It's from food science, the other ones from industrial crops and products. So there's a trade-off. There's always a trade-off between the disruptive and the traditional. I mean, is it really going to make a difference? Is there really controlled extraction? Does it really matter when it's doing that? What are your trade-offs? So as you're looking at some of these, is staying with the standards or moving things forward? So when we look at everything we talk about, it really is the wellness of natural products that we're typically understanding. And it's also being able to understand the basis of separation and concentration, extraction versus separation, and how we transition to a regulatory market. Each one of these is going to provide us a clear path from tea to coffee to cannabis.